Um, so I'd love to introduce Nick. Um, thank you again for giving us of your time. Um, Nicholas Bazmanes is the author of 10 critically acclaimed works of cultural history with a particular emphasis on various aspects of books and book culture. His first book, A Gentle Madness, Bibliophiles, Bibliomanes, and Eternal Passion for Books was a finalist in 1995 in 1995 for the National Books Critic Circle Award for Nonfiction and was named a New York Times Notable Book. And his most recent release, Cross of Snow, A Life of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, was published just this past June by Alfred A. Knopf and has already been hailed as essential and a sheer joy to read by Library Journal, absorbing by the Boston Globe, Valuable, comprehensive, affectionate, and astute by Kirkus Reviews, and an excellent addition to a worthy cause by Publishers Weekly. His previous effort on paper, the everything of its 2000 year history, uh, was one of three finalists for the Andrew Carnegie Medal of Excellence in Nonfiction in 2014. And he also writes the Gently Mad column for Fine Books and Collections magazine, lectures widely on books related subjects and is a frequent contributor to humanities magazines and other national publications. And he and his wife, Constance, live in North Grafton, Massachusetts. And because he does so much, I had to read all that. <laughs> but it is wonderful to have you. And so Nick, I'm gonna turn this over to you. I'm gonna um, fade out with my video. So the Zoom is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful in introduction and thank you for inviting me to uh, be here with uh, with the people from the Wayside Inn and people from Texas and from Alabama, uh, wonderful. Welcome to New England. It's uh, uh, wonderful to be talking to you tonight about a son of New England and, and, and uh, who had not only national uh, following, but an international following. He was easily the, one of, easily the most celebrated and most popular uh, author of the, uh, of the English speaking world in the 19th century. The Wayside Inn is so important uh, to this book. And when Sally said that uh, my son-in-law and my uh, younger daughter, Nicole, stopped by one day to, and they were chatting and talking up the new book. Well, I, I very definitely, I must have been explain, exclaiming to them that I really have to get out to the Long, Longfellow's Wayside Inn because this, this place is essential for the book, uh, Cross of So. And so I put up, and I know you have a new logo and I like them both, if you don't mind, I put both up there for this introduction because they're both quite beautiful and they're both relevant to Longfellow and to the tales of the Wayside Inn. So as we will pursue here, try to get this thing going. There we go. So uh, Sally showed the book, but here it is again, the cover. <clears throat> it is relevant to the talk because that photograph was taken in 1868 in England at the absolute height of Longfellow's celebrity. It amounted pretty much to a victory tour. He was traveling not only through England, but through Europe. There was an entourage of 10 people. He had been received at, the, uh, at Windsor Castle by Queen Victoria. And uh, she remarked in her diary that night how, how really astounded she was. And I, I quote this in the book, to notice as he was leaving that the domestic staff was taking positions, hiding behind curtains up on balustrades, trying to get a peek at this man with the long flowing beard. And she really questioned them afterwards. She said, this man's a poet. Do you know him? And they said, we all know him. We all love him. We all love his work, which kind of gives you, a, gives you an idea of just, just the extent of his popularity at the time. This was England in 1868, five years after the publication of Tales of a Wayside Inn. And he was more popular in England. His book sold better at the time than Alfred Lord Tennyson, who was a poet laureate, and Robert Browning. And we have Tennyson alone to, 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 to cite for this fact. He was once asked, how much money do you make a year from your books? He said, well, I'm, I'm making 3,000 pounds a year, but Longfellow makes 5,000. And they were good friends, so he was not, he was not uh, upset about it. But this is Henry at, at the height of his celebrity. And this picture was a photograph was taken by uh, Julia M Margaret Cameron a very famous portrait photographer. He was brought to see her, by the way, on the Isle of Wight by Tennyson. And he had also, the previous couple of days earlier, he had met with Charles Dickens, same day as he met with Queen Victoria. So it's keep, important to keep in mind, this is, this is the Longfellow that, that the world knows and knew. 
and you'll see there was a different Longfellow. Now, I was originally going to call this talk tonight a tale of two houses, and I thought that would be a good try because it goes beyond the houses. But we're looking at what is arguably the best known inn in the United States. I, I think it's been, it's been demonstrated that it's the oldest operating inn, inn and hostelry in the same place. And this is my photograph of a year ago before everything turned upside down. But it has been viewed by many people in very many different ways over the years. And here's a wonderful etching from 1910 from a, a book called American Memorial Etchings and kind of an idyllic view of the house. And here's a photograph from the 1890s. And here's a, the Inn in the Old Days, sketched by C.A. Lawrence in Art Decoration, October 1916. Well, the Inn actually, when Longfellow visited it for the first time in 1816, was closed. It was almost, it wasn't derelict, but the Howe family, which owned it, uh, the, the former owner had passed, a, uh, had passed away. And Henry Longfellow was such a critical point in his life. It was 1862. His wife, Fanny, who, will be, who we will be discussing presently in, in my comments, had died the previous year. It was in the middle of the Civil War. He was devastated. He was grieving. And as he said, it is so hard for me to do original work when my mind is, uh, is preoccupied with other things, mainly the grief, grief over the loss of his wife, Fanny. So he turned to a couple of projects. One was he, he turned to translating the whole of Dante's uh, Divine Comedy into English. He was the first American to do so, and today it is still regarded as the best, one of the best translations into English uh, by anyone, not just an American. And he was also working on what he, what he envisioned as a kind of American takeoff of the Canterbury Tales. And he was looking for a place where he could set this. He had already started, he was calling it Wayside Tales, Wayside Tales, kind of like, and his, his publisher, Judge, uh, uh, Tickner, James, uh, I beg your pardon, James T. Fields knew of this place out in Sudbury. And on Halloween day in 1862, they came and they visited this place. He, they were shown around and Longfellow knew instantly this was the place. And so he was going to call it, originally he was going to call it Sudbury Tales. And, and, and it was set in type. And then finally he changed his mind. And he said, you know, people are going to say, well, they didn't use the word knockoff, but that would have been the suggestion that it was derivative. It was a knockoff to Canterbury Tales. He says, so why don't we call it instead Tales of a Wayside Inn? Now, the image in the middle is the uh, title page of the first, first printing in 1863. The image at the right is of one of the, uh, one of the seven narrators of this uh, book of poetry. Now, Longfellow did something he really had never done before. He, he re very rarely wrote poetry about living people actual living people. Now, uh, he did write a poem about Florence Nightingale for the first issue of The Atlantic, but for something book length, he decided to, to take living people and make each one of them a narrator, much, much like Canterbury Tales, and set them where Canterbury Tales is they stop at an inn on the way to Canterbury to the uh, uh, shrine for Sir Thomas More. He would have them gather in an inn outside of New England. It was perfect for his, for his purposes. A year later, now the, that book was published in November of 1863. It sold 15,000 copies within a matter of days. It became what is easily a runaway bestseller. And this image that you see here is quite, quite wonderful because it, it appeared, it was issued within a year. It's a Courier and Ives chromolithograph, 1864, just a year later. And the scene was uh, after an artist, Fanny Parker, who did really a lot of the most important uh, paintings from which uh, Curry and I was, uh, made, it, made their prints. And it evokes the opening scene. You've got the moon, you've got the sign for the, uh, red, uh, the red horse and the sign. And, and there, there's Longfellow's uh, uh, stanzas over there where he's discussing this ancient is this hostelry. And the very last couple of lines is uh, half erected by rain as the red horse prances on the sign. So, so just to, just to give you know how, how absolutely popular Longfellow was uh, in his time, and, and, and this changed everything for the Wayside Inn. It came back in business shortly thereafter. They changed the name to Longfellow's Wayside Inn, which has stuck, uh, stuck with it all these years. And now uh, here we are more than 150 years later, this wonderful institution in Sudbury, Massachusetts, which thousands of people come and enjoy every year. And, uh, and it's really a, a very iconic kind of a place, much like another structure that we will be getting to along the way in my comments. 
the very first, the very first tale and and uh, tales of the wayside then was the landlord's tale, and that was he, he put that in the voice of uh, Lyman Howe, who the Howe family had owned the house, and uh, uh, very interestingly enough, it was Paul Revere's right. We all know, listen, my children, and you shall hear. I mean, right off the bat, he's speaking, listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere, and that had been published on the day that South Carolina seceded from the Union. So we go back to 1861, and it is arguably the most memorized poem in American history. Longfellow was, was no fool. He knew how to maximize his intellectual property. And one of the things he was able to do with this book, which is why he chose this kind of a format where he would have seven different voices of real people, real people, would be to take works that he had already written or that he had works that he had translated, because he knew 15 languages uh, uh, thoroughly, in which he, he, he was a translator, not only of Italian, but of Spanish, of Italian, French. We'll get to that uh, shortly. But he was able to do that within the hardcovers of this book. And uh, I, this, uh, that was a stamp, the stamp that was issued on the bicentennial of Henry's birth in 2007. And of course, the image that they chose to illustrate it is Paul Revere. The image on the right is, was issued by the, um, propaganda office, for want of a better name, of the United States government during World War II as, a, as, a, as an appeal to patriotism to, to uh, buy bonds. So who, whoever says that Longfellow has lost his resonance over the decades, I uh, really should look into it a little bit more. But again, here's Henry as uh, he was known to his millions of admirers, and I say millions around the world. The portrait uh, at the right, uh, to the right, by George Peter Alexander Healy was done in 1862. So that's kind of what he looked like. That is what he looked like when he visited the Wayside Inn. The statue in the middle, middle is a replica of the statue that was erected in Westminster Abbey in Poets' Corner. And to this day, Longfellow is the only American to have his bust uh, featured in, West, in Poets' Corner or Westminster Abbey. That just gives you a, an indication of how famous and how beloved he was not only in the United States, but around the world. And that image on the left, undated, but that's Henry with his, it was one of his friends called him a fat terrier, but it was a mixed terrier. And after the death of his wife, it had been his, one of his sons, uh, Charlie's pet, it became Henry and the dog became uh, just inseparable. Again, we talk about the influence that goes beyond the reading of the poetry. And uh, just to give you some idea of, of how deeply uh, influential Longfellow was throughout American culture. And I just picked a couple of uh, images here. That, that image on the left is called the Magnolia House. For 20 years, it, it was a replica of the Longfellow House in Cambridge, which we will be looking at shortly, that they sold replicas to and was one of their very best sellers. It was high end, they called it the Magnolia. There, there's what it looked like in the Sears catalog. And this is over 20 years after his death. The image on the right is a box of uh, Longfellow cigars. That's a Wedgwood uh, picture on the left and a, a little photo album. And just to give you this idea, uh, here's the classic comic book of the Song of Hiawatha. And uh, I've decided because of my Greek background, I'd show you the Greek, the Greek version of the classic comic books of, of, uh, of a famous Longfellow classic. It just everywhere, it was so pervasive. This is a fan that was presented to Henry by the American uh, ambassador to China in, eight, in the 18th, 1868, uh, Burlingame, uh, Anson Burlingame, was visiting Henry and Craigie House, as the house was known. And this is his first breakthrough poem of 1839 called The Psalm of Life. And it had been, it had been uh, uh, the court calligrapher had painted a translation of that poem, Psalm of Life, on this exquisite fan which was presented to Henry, and that's Henry's handwriting on the bottom of Psalm of Life. He documented everything and it was given to him as a gift. The Psalm of Life is very interesting also with respect to Wayside Inn. When Henry Ford bought the property in 1923, and basically saved it and allowed for the development of the institution and the foundation that we have today, running Wayside Inn, he, somebody asked him, why are you doing this? Why are you saving this old inn? And he said, I am in debt to Longfellow and his poem, The Psalm of Life. And he cited four stanzas, you know, which, which were particularly uh, important. If I have them in the book, we can read it. But this is the poem that really impacted uh, people all over the world and really allowed uh, Longfellow to become 
a national name. This was in 1839. And you talk about paparazzi before there was even paparazzi. Here's Longfellow. Uh, this is 1878. So it's a, he's getting along in years. This is four years before his death. And he even wrote a letter. He said, there stood another photographer with his deadly instrument aimed at us. And as the picture, this became a stereoscopic image. This is how, how iconic his house was. People came and visited his house as literary pilgrims. But this is the Longfellow as known by both of his wives. He was married twice. He was a young man, very handsome, loved beautiful clothing. And that's that, that painting on the left uh, hangs in Longfellow House in Cambridge. That's a, a silhouette in the middle that was done around the time he came to Harvard as a professor. And we have a few other pictures where he was at, uh, uh, profiled. These are, this is a wonderful painting of, by Eastman Johnson, which hangs in the house. And this is the only time Winslow Homer ever did a portrait of Longfellow. And he did it from a photograph. So I don't know whether or not they ever met, but it's kind of a nice picture that I thought I'd show it to you. Well, he's an American, a true American, a son of New England. He was named for Lieutenant Henry Wadsworth, who died heroically in the Battle of Tripoli in 1804. Uh, he it was a horrific accident. This, he was on a fire ship that uh, inexplicably blew up in the harbor, and he and 12 others died in that uh, accident. And he was 22 years old. And in fact, after in 1806, the uh, memorial that you see at the right was the, we heard a lot in the news lately about war memorial, memorials. That is the very first war memorial, veterans memorial erected in the United States anywhere. It was first erected in Washington, D.C. It was brought to the United States. It was made of Carrera marble aboard old Ironsides. And it stood in uh, Washington for the 1860s, and then it was moved to Annapolis, the Naval Academy, where it is now. But he was very proud of his, his forebears. His grandfather, Peleg Wadsworth, was a hero, a general in the Revolutionary War. They moved to Maine, and his family came from Maine. So it was a very prestigious uh, an influential uh, New England family, and he was always very proud of his New England roots. But that's not to say he didn't have uh, some foreign flares. And, and I hope those of you who read my book uh, pay attention to chapter two, which I, <clears throat> pardon me, call Awakening. When Harry graduated from Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine, at the age of 18, so he was 18 when he graduated, fourth in his class, and a class that included Nathaniel Hawthorne, very high achievers. Uh, there have been studies about the, the 38 members of the class and the things that they did. Horatio Bridge served in, in Lincoln's cabinet uh, there was, there were senators and judges and Longfellow and Hawthorne just kind of led the pack. So on his 18th, uh, on, uh, on, on, his, on the day of his commencement from Bowdoin College, the trustees voted to offer young Henry Longfellow the position of professor of modern languages they would become the fourth college in the United States, Harvard, William & Mary, University of Virginia were the others. They had a bequest from the widow of James Bowden uh, who wanted these languages taught. First thing always, they had to go to Europe and learn the languages he would be required to teach. And for three years, and I call the chapter awakening in many respects. And you see Henry there, these are self portraits. So not only was he, he a very skilled poet and writer and essayist, and he, he excelled in every kind of poetic form, he was also a very clever and skilled uh, artist. And these were images that are, are, are in his journals. I photographed these directly from his journals at the Houghton Library at Harvard. And there he is in Spain, and he's quoting Byron Child, uh, Harold's pilgrimage below to horse to horse. There he is in Gottingen in uh, Germany, HWL uh, in the clouds at Gottingen. And at the right, there he is as Enrico when he was uh, in Italy. And he had. Uh, he fell in love twice. I've, I've documented it. He, he was Henry. You will find throughout life, throughout his life, beginning with his mother, who he, with whom he had an, an extraordinary intellectual relationship, not just a loving mother-son uh, relationship. But Henry was always deeply respectful of women. In fact, as he said once in one of his <clears throat> lectures at Harvard years later, when talking about Dante, he said, "Throughout the work of Dante, you will never find a single disparagement of women." And I say, my observation of the book is you can say the very same thing about Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. In any case, this is Henry in his own eyes, self-portraits uh, during that, first, that, that, that extraordinary trip abroad. This trip is also responsible, not only for his learning, he came back with a half a dozen languages and he would go abroad again 10 years later to learn more. But he becomes, you see the beginnings of, of Longfellow, the multiculturalist, culturalist, 
decades before that phrase even entered the language. As he wrote his college uh, valedictory, he was fourth, he gave an oration. And at the last minute, he changed the subject from uh, uh, an appreciation of Chatterton to our native writers, how America still had yet to develop a distinctive style of writing. So he was determined to do that, but he was also de determined to do that by learning and incorporating uh, foreign traditions. He not only learned languages, he learned literatures. And this is Henry as when he arrived, as he was painted uh, by a uh, prominent artist, professor of modern languages. That's there he is, the 22-year-old uh, full professor at Bowdoin College. And he married a lovely young woman, Mary Stora Potter Longfellow. She was the daughter of a judge. And when he was offered this, a similar position at Harvard University, uh, Harvard College, it wasn't a, a university yet, but to become all, the Smith Professor of Modern Languages there. But he had to go to Europe and learn more languages and to really perfect his German. His wife really did not want to go with him. We've been able to document that. She was a very fragile woman. He loved her dearly, but uh, tragically she died uh, following a miscarriage, a horrible loss for which he grieved um, just, just uh, uh, endlessly. She died while they were in, in Holland, and yet he soldiered on. He got, he got advice to, to continue with his studies. He had to go on. In 1839, the very same year that he publishes a book, which I, we will talk about uh, in a second, called Hyperion, he, he uh, published this poem, uh, Footsteps of Angels, and it was his very first collection of poetry that was uh, published as a collection, and he pays tribute to Mary here, and she She's, it's a visitation of an angel, and she sits and gazes at me with those deep and tender eyes, like the stars so still and saint-like, looking downward from the skies, uttered not, yet comprehended in the Spirit's voiceless prayer. Soft rebukes, what is she rebuking him for? And blessings ended, breathing from the lips of air. He was, when he wrote that, he was in the depths of depression. He soldiered on, he learned his, his languages, his German, Finally, he said, I can't take anymore. I'm going off on a trek. I'm gonna, the air of the fatherland will do me good. In Switzerland, seven or eight months later in July of 1836, he meets this extraordinary young woman from Boston, Massachusetts, Frances Elizabeth Appleton, who he, he was invited by the Appleton family. They were one of the wealthiest families of Massachusetts. They were impressed by young Henry Longfellow. They invited him to travel with them for a fortnight, he did. And he was dazzled by this young woman who was brilliant and striking in every respect, uh, impeccably tutored from an early age, from the age of six or seven or eight. Francis uh, 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 Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, George Barrel Emerson, Francis Lieber. I mean, her teachers were mul multiple, and she was a brilliant woman who valued intellect above everything else. But she wasn't interested. And uh, I wouldn't say she wasn't interested. She just, um, when Henry came back to the United States, he began visiting the Appletons on Beacon Hill. He failed, it was a seven year courtship. And finally he wrote a novel about it, Hyperion. It was, that was the second dumbest uh, mistake he made in his life. I think the first was to insist that Mary go to Europe with him, but to write a novel where, where Fanny Appleton would be Mary Ashburton, the woman on the left, and Henry would be Paul Fleming, was a big mistake. Notice the evening and the morning star he refers to Fanny in that, in that uh, novel there. Well, this is, this is Fanny Appleton. This is the young woman he met in Switzerland and as she was sculpted in Florence during this grand tour that she was making with her family of Europe by Lorenzo Bartolini in Florence. And there she is as she was painted by Jean-Baptiste Isabey in Paris in 1835. That painting uh, hung in the Louvre for a while before it came to the United States. It now hangs in, in Longfellow House. He was dazzled by her. And she was, again, I, I mentioned this uh, Beacon Hill milieu. This is her home on 39 Beacon Street, Boston. This is a very rare picture. There really aren't that many photographs of the house as it appeared then when the Appletons uh, occupied it. Another floor was added, so added some years later. I got this from Massachusetts Historic Trust. Uh, and that's kind of, that's the house that, uh, that she lived at the top of Beacon Hill. This is, this is a contemporary view from 1843, the year they were married. And the, the Appleton home would more or less be over there on the right. This is kind of what it looked like while, they, while he was wooing her. Here's a later picture, same area. These are from the 1890s. So this is the, we talk about Beacon Hill in Boston, the Beacon Hill, Boston, Cambridge, 
concrete access, the intellectual access, plays such a prominent role in my book. It's not just a, not just a story of Henry Longfellow and his wife and the, uh, the uh, union, which became this extraordinary intellectual relationship. But I try really to give you the flavor of, of, of social Boston, literary Boston. And, uh, and this, these are some of the views of, of what we're talking about. These are Fanny's parents as painted by Gilbert Stewart. Uh, Maria Teresa Gold Appleton on the left, and uh, her husband Nathan Appleton on the right. He was the man who established Lowell, Massachusetts, where I happen to, by coincidence, have been born and brought up. But the first industrial city in the United States, the textile city, uh, he was the man who founded that. As a consequence, he was exceedingly wealthy. And these are some views of Lowell <clears throat> as, it, as it appeared uh, during, that, during these years. Charles Dickens visited it. Everyone visited it. It was a famous city. And this was the essence, this was the basis of the Appleton family wealth. And again, we're looking at, uh, that, that's the house on the left is uh, the home of George Tickner, who was Henry's predecessor as a, as a Smith professor at Harvard, had picked Henry to replace him. And Henry came to Harvard where he taught for 18 years. And again, this is another view of Boston Common, same time. Now this is a very interesting uh, <coughs> item. Uh, as a writer, I, I place a great reliance on material objects, things, things that will help you understand your biographical subject better. And one of the really attractive elements of this project, one of the reasons I wanted to write about Longfellow, and not only for the fact that he hadn't really been written about uh, to, to the extent that I, I decided to do for 50 years, and his wife Fanny had never been written out, written about to any great depth, but also because uh, Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters, National Historic Park is unique as, as a home of American authors. It's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's operated by the National Park Service. What makes it unique is not only is it the home of this extraordinary writer, but also the fact that everything in there is authentic. All of the paintings, all of the furnishings, all of the cutlery, everything you see in that house is as it pretty much as it was in Longfellow's time. And that's because it went directly from the Longfellow family, 1953 to the National Park Service. It's an amazing facility. And in addition to these objects, has by their reckoning, 750,000 to 800,000 archival material. This one, this, what you're looking at is Fanny's wedding present. When she finally, after seven years of wooing, you'll have to read the book as to how this finally comes to pass. It's a great story. That was another, another attractive element, the great story. I'm, I am drawn to great stories, narrative. Don't mean a thing if I didn't get that swing. And when I saw this elegantly tooled leather uh, sketchbook, green uh, gold gilt tooling and green leather Morocco, it's extraordinary. And she was quite the artist. And she, these are sketches that she made when they met in Switzerland in 1836. And what she has written on their wedding day, if you look at the fly, at the fly leaf on the left, the paste down rather, Mary Ashburton to Paul Fleming, July 13, 1843. What she is saying essentially is that the dead past has buried its dead. That's a line from the Psalm of Life. Whatever our differences were, and she was not happy about that book, Hyperion, she had said, we bury the hatchet, and now we are man and wife. And, for the, and it is so significant because this marriage to Fanny Appleton ushers in 18 years of absolutely uh, uninterrupted uh, literary pr productivity. All of the great, the really great narrative poems, uh, uh, Hiawatha, Evangeline, Miles Standage, Paul Revere's Ride, the building of the ship, one after the other. They are now, they now flow from his pen during these years. And she, as you will see in the pages of the book, is an active participant. Now, I'm not gonna say she's a collaborator. I can't prove that. But he counseled her on everything. She read everything. She responds critically to everything that he writes. In some instances, she even suggests poems that he should be writing. And here she is. And this is the only love poem that Henry ever wrote. You know, we talk about the exact contemporaries, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Robert Browning, who had magnificent love letters. There are no love letters that were exchanged between these two. The simple reason being that for the seven years that he was courting her, they weren't speaking, basically. And then once they were married, Henry, as he wrote in a letter to a, uh, a person in England who was inquiring whether he might be coming to Europe, and if so, would he bring his wife? 
Henry says, our theory of life is that we, will we must never be separated. Once together, it was an extraordinary relationship. Remember I said the evening star and the morning star, that line from Hyperion, whether you have it here. I, this is really one of the most beautiful po uh, love poems, and it's a sonnet. Henry Longfellow, in my estimation, humble, is by far the best American author of sonnets now. He's not Shakespeare, he's not Keats, he's not Shelley, he's not Wordsworth, but they're all Brits. This is an American uh, sonneteer, and he didn't write a lot of them. They only read about 40 of them. Towards uh, special occasions like this, and another very important occasion, which we'll talk about shortly. But I try to bring a lot of the things that are going on in Boston at the time. This is the Ether Monument in uh, the Boston Public Garden. It's the very first monument uh, erected there, 1846. Why is that here? Fanny Appleton was the first woman in North America to deliver a child with the assistance of ether as an obstetric anesthetic. Doctors wouldn't give it to women. They would not allow women uh, to, to have this, uh, this life, uh, uh, this amazing development, this wonder of the age to, to use it during childbirth. They used it only during surgery and dentistry. And Fanny, when she heard how successful it was, <clears throat> a, a child had been delivered in Scotland. She had heard about to a woman who had a, a deformed pelvis. Everything was fine. Henry lobbied and he finally got Dr. Nathan Cooley Keep, a dentist, the founding dean of the Harvard Dental School, to administer her the ether during childbirth. Everything went well. And within a year, more than 500 women had, had, had taken it. And she writes quite eloquent, eloquently about how she hoped what she had done would be a contribution to womankind, she used that word. And then Henry viewed from his father's town host the introduction of running water into Boston. Quite an event, you know, we take, take for granted over 100,000 people. And he writes in his journal about this wondrous fountain that rises in the air. And then during the Civil War, on the same street, he watches, he observes that the 54th uh, Regiment, the all black unit, marches south to fight in the Civil War. I mentioned two houses, a tale of two houses. This is the other house which I call a house for all seasons. These are my photographs, by the way. Also known as Washington's headquarters, Longfellow House, because uh, it was during the siege of Boston, uh, the command headquarters and official residence of General George Washington. This is a view of the fall of the American Antiquarian Society. I gave a presentation there a couple of weeks ago, and they took this, had this picture of their collections and they put it up in, uh, in uh, promoting that talk. And I said, wait a minute, I got a photo just like that. That's from the garden in the back looking at the house. And you can see in the distance the Charles River and the image at the left, you can't really see it today. This is how the house appeared in 1853 while they were married, living there. So it's still very, very rural. I mean, she was a city girl. She came from across the Charles River. It was not Beacon Hill, but he was a Harvard professor expected to live in Cambridge. And this is where they lived. This is a chromolithograph. How famous was the house? 1904. That's the, that's the way the house appeared when Washington was there. That's how Washington appeared when he lived there. Pretty much 1779, Charles Wilson Peale. Uh, this image, I don't know the source of it, but I got the photograph of it from a journal that Henry kept in Harvard, just on Craigie House, and it was called Craigie House for former owner. And you can see that the piazzas, which were later added by uh, Andrew Craigie out there, but Henry had that picture in his journal. I said, good enough for Henry, it's good enough for me. He was ever mindful that George Washington lived in this house. And once, ah, once within these walls, one whom memory oft recalls, the father of his country dwelt. And that's from the poem, To a Child, which he, that's a stanza which he wrote out in his hand. And it's framed, as you can see in that image on the right, and it's on the second floor. Of course, people shoot by the thousands to visit this house. And they always, they, in, most of them, the vast majority of them saw it from the outside. Many of them would knock on the door. Henry would answer the door. It was, he was always the one who would answer. He kept a stack of autograph cards nearby and he would dispense them. But getting in, being invited inside was kind of a treat. And this is the dining room. And we talk about the Longfellow uh, entertaining people at dinner. Uh, Henry said it is a rare Sunday when we don't have anyone for dinner. And that's the room where Charles Dickens comes and has Thanksgiving dinner in 1867, which I write about. And this is after the horrific death of Fanny Longfellow in 1861. But uh, that's the dining room. And that's the, those are the Gilbert Stewart paintings off to the left. The picture you see in the middle there is the Buchanan Reed portrait of their three daughters. Uh, 
which became very famous uh, in the children's hour poem, which is this is the study, the library rather. This is where Fanny Appleton, if you don't know the story, uh, she was sealing some lockets of hair from one of her daughters on uh, July the 9th, 1861. And I, I have to tell you, it was the hardest chapter I, I had to write. And uh, she was sealing them with a lighted candle and her dress caught fire. She ran with a rush into the study where Henry was next door. He tried desperately to put out the flames with a rug. He did, but she uh, passed away the following morning. Henry uh, suffered severe burns. That's the reason from that, from that day forward, he never shaved again. And that's why he grew that beard that we know him by. This is known as the Martha Washington Parlor in the front. The Bartolini sculpture I mentioned, I showed you earlier, is in the corner on the left. That's Fanny's writing desk. She wrote over 900 letters. I'm the first person to use uh, uh, all, as many of them as I had full access to all of them for this book. And as you'll see, I quote generously from them. The voice is magnificent. And when Henry wrote that poem, The Children's Hour, that famous, uh, that famous poem, I hear in the chamber above me, the patter of little feet. How many, how many phrases that we use daily don't realize come from Longfellow? Here's, here's, here are two of them in one stanza. The patter of little feet, the sound of a door that is open, and voices, soft and sweet, soft and sweet. From my study I see in the lamplight, descending the broad hall stair, brave Alice and laughing Allegra, and Edith with golden hair. It was Edith, the girl with the golden hair, whose lockets that Fanny was trimming when she had that horrible accident. Well, if we had the phrase man cave, this would be it. This is Henry's study. This is where he met, where he did all of his writing. The doors were never closed. The children were always welcome to come down and jump into Papa's lap. He called it Papa. It's where he met with his friends. It's where George Washington conducted the councils of war during the siege of Boston. After Fanny's death, when he turned to writing, to compiling the wayside in and translating Dante into English, this is where the famous Dante Club met. Lots of things happened in there. The favorite activity of Fanny and Henry, bar none, every day was reading to each other as a couple every night. And the only sketch Fanny ever made of Henry that we know of is the one at the left. And the only sketch that he made of Fanny at the right, same year, 1847, both pictured in the study, presumably both after an evening of reading. Here's Henry in his studies, 18, this is after Fanny's death. Here he is again. And Henry had wonderful friendships. His male friendships were essential. Here he is with Charles Sumner, the, Sumner, the great abolitionist. These are portraits of, of these other people, Nathaniel Hawthorne being one of them, Emerson another, uh, Cornelius Conway Felton. These were, he commissioned these paintings by uh, Eastman Johnson. And uh, uh, issues I don't have time to get into here, but I discuss them in the book, his response to slavery, the the 18-year uh, the run-up, I mean, the, the, their, their marriage in 1843 uh, to 1861 is, is simultaneous with, with the run-up to the Civil War. I deal a great deal with that. Uh, uh, the, the Fugitive Slave Act, Henry meets with uh, Ellen Craft, who was a fugitive slave, who came to Boston disguised as a gentleman, a white gentleman, with her manservant, who was actually her husband, who met with them. He wrote, people who say Henry didn't write about slavery or uh, confront it, he was the first American poet to write a volume of poems, seven poems, 1842 poems on slavery. And there's his friend Charles Sumner being beaten to within inches of his life on the Senate floor uh, in 1856 after he gave the crime against Kansas. We, it figures prominently in the book. So I showed you the house and the other seasons. And there's Henry in his writing in his journal. He planted those lilac trees. The purple buds of the lilacs tipped the hedges, tipped the hedges. And the flowery tide of spring, spring sweeps on May 20th, 1861. So the, the southern states have already, have already seceded and we, we are in the civil war. And Fanny's horrific accident is just five or six weeks away. Who's to predict anything? This is Fanny's favorite portrait of Henry. And that portrait on the right is his favorite portrait of her. Significant, what I'm about to show you next. So why did I call the book Cross of Snow? I mentioned the importance of objects and of place and of things. Everything comes together in this sequence here and in this poem. Now, when I was doing my research, now the Cross of Snow is a sonnet. 
written on the 18th anniversary of Fanny's death. They had been married for 18 magnificent, blissful, productive years, and in a heartbeat, in an instant, it was turned upside down. And he, he would say he had five children, and he wrote in a letter to a friend who was expressing his condolences. He says, out to the outside world, I am a perfect calm. He said, but in, inwardly, I am bleeding to death. And on the 18th anniversary of, his of her death, in his room, in the bedroom on the second floor, and there's the painting I just showed you in the previous frame, a painting that he only, only Henry sees is in this most intimate of rooms, and that's all the original furnishings. He writes this poem, The Cross of Snow. It's a, it's a standard sonnet, and it's uh, eight lines in the front piece of the piece of paper and six lines in the back, and it's a contemplation of two, two paintings, the one you see on the wall, and it begins this way. In the long sleepless watches of the night, a gentle face, the face of one long dead, looks at me from the wall where round its head the night lamp casts a halo of pale light. Here, in this room, she died, and never more white, and soul more white, never through martyrdom of fire was led to its repose, nor can in books be read the legend of a life more benedite. So we jump to the other side, and now he contemplates a painting which he had recently seen at the Philadelphia Exposition called The Mountain of the Holy Cross by Thomas Moran. It had caused a sensation, recently discovered mountain in the Rockies in the West, and, and it had a, the image of a cross on the side, on its side, it moved to deep ravines that didn't melt in the winter, and that electrified Henry. So now he contemplated personally by himself, singularly, the portrait of his wife. Now he contemplates this painting. There is a mountain in the distant west that sun defying in its deep ravines displays a cross of snow upon its side. Such is the cross I wear upon my breast these 18 years through all the changing scenes and seasons, changeless since the day she died. He wears a cross of grief and contrition upon his chest the size of a mountain. And, and he kept that to himself. He folded it up in that envelope you saw placed it among his papers not to be read in his lifetime, discovered after his death and published posthumously. And when I saw that poem and read that poem, I said, there is the architecture for this book that I want to write about this love story, which is what it is fundamentally, but also of this great poet who I think unfairly has been dismissed by too many critics, but he's making a comeback, thankfully. I hope this book has something to do with it. I hope people, places like the Wayside Inn have something to do with it. And when you hear and see a poem like that, you say, this man is too good to be forgotten. And then finally, I have this image of uh, every year Christmas, the Longfellow House uh, has an open house and they put out these lanterns. And I had this wonderful poem, you know, Christmas Bells. And of course it's famous. I heard the bells on Christmas day, their old familiar carols play and wild and sweet the worlds repeat, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. The backstory to that is Henry's, after Fanny's death, Henry's 17 year old son, Charlie, ran off and joined the Union Army. Didn't, didn't tell his father where he was going. When he finally found out where he was, he didn't, he could have sent him home. He was under, had him sent home, but he was underage. Uh, instead, he, he supported him. Charlie got wounded in combat. He got camp fever. And once when Henry was visiting him in Washington, they're helping nursing back to health. On a Sunday morning, he was in his hotel and he heard the cannonade. He was in Washington and he could hear the artillery in, uh, across the Potomac River. And at the same time, he could hear these church bells. And that came to him six months later when he wrote this poem, Christmas Bells. So that's my formal presentation. I think I've probably gone longer than I'm supposed to, but uh, I'm going to return it now to Sally. And here we are. Thank you. I ran a little long, Sally. I'm sorry, but no, it was terrific. I could have heard more and more poetry read. Um, thank you so much. That was fascinating, and I learned some things that I didn't know. Um, and I was an English major, but I didn't realize he was an artist too. So it was great to see um, those examples of the sketches. He's quite um, good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm checking now to see if anybody has any questions in the chat. So if you want to take a minute, people, to um, put some in there. 
um, then I can I can facilitate that. Um, I do have a question actually though, um, uh, because you show that that amazing sketchbook, um, and I kind of wondered in preparing for your project how many archives you might have visited, and if there was anything um, more unexpected that you found in in any of those, and and how long it took you to really I, assemble. I became. I decided I was going to do the book 12, well, in 2007, uh, which was his bicentennial year. <clears throat> and I wrote an appreciation of his bicentennial that year for a Smithsonian Magazine. And that was my first visit to Longfellow House. And I had a few other projects that I had to do, but I really wanted to do this book. And, and it was, a, I have to tell you, it was not an easy sell because Longfellow has, has been kind of forgotten and dismissed unfairly, in my view, as a poet. And so I had to make the case for him. And thankfully, I have a wonderful editor at Alfred Knopf, Vicki Wilson, who saw the merit in it. And she not only published it, she published it gorgeously. As you, I mean, I really have to give her credit. It's a beautiful yeah. book, the end sheets. And, and uh, I spent, you know, 10 years off and on, but uh, six years intensely in Longfellow House, not there. I mean, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. I mean, the, I think they were wondering there, is he ever going to finish this book? And at the same time, I was just a half a mile away as the Houghton Library at Harvard, which has all of his literary correspondence, all of his, uh, all of his literary manuscripts, all of the incoming letters, thousands of incoming letters, which were fantastic, I have to tell you. I mean, not only the letters that he wrote, but you get the other side of the conversation. And it's uh, pretty interesting stuff and I made very full use of it. To answer your question, and then also Bowdoin College up in Maine and where he taught and where he was a student, he had some wonderful archives and Massachusetts Historical Society had some great stuff in the album. So I think uh, to answer your question, are there any surprises that, that I missed? Um, I, I hope not, I don't think so. Um, for me, the, the biggest surprise wasn't much of a surprise at all, but it just validated the sense that I had that this was a really very, very good and decent man. He's everything that he pur pur was purported to be. Everybody, there, you cannot find a bad word about him. The only person who dislikes him is Edgar Allan Poe, who never met him and is intensely jealous of that. all the wrong reasons uh, as, as, as an adversary. And Henry drives him crazy by never responding. To mention to a, a young man who he, who he was mentoring, William Winter, he said, you're at the beginning of your career. Let me give you some advice. People will say bad things about you. My advice is ignore it. Don't, don't respond. <laughs> and uh, and he, that, that, he, he followed that. And, uh, but he's such a decent man. And he loved his, both of his wives. He was a good husband. He was a wonderful father. And so I, I guess that, that wasn't a surprise so much, but it was a validation. And I guess what I really wanted to find him. I was delighted to find it. Well, thank you. Um, and we do actually have some questions. Uh, so one of the questions from Catherine is, where are Fanny's letters archived? Are they yeah. in one place? And thank could you. you describe what it was like to read and study those? That is an excellent question. Thank you. Because uh, Henry's correspondence and all of his literary material went to Harvard, to the Houghton Library in 1953. But all of Fanny's stuff, is still in, in the Longfellow house. And they have photographed them digitally. digitally. They're, very, they're very fragile. Uh, and you're a scholar, you can go and you can handle them if you want. But I should have had some images up there of her writing because paper, I, as I wrote in my previous book, very scarce. And when she was writing letters, for instance, she would write, you know, left to right, fill that side of the paper, and she would turn it and write in this direction and try, just transcribing these things can take for Thankfully, I did not have to transcribe them all. I was so fortunate in that the National Park Service, the archivist, as a project for her bicentennial in 2017, they transcribed all of her correspondence and all of her journals. Her journals are just as fascinating. Uh, I quote generously and co copiously from her journals. She's so brilliant. When you, when you read her, 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 her observations, she's a critic. She, she, goes to these art museums throughout Italy and she's writing critically about every painting that she sees, every work of architecture that she sees. She doesn't take suffer fools blandly. People, 
Of course, she's striking. She's five feet, 10 inches tall, two inches taller than Henry, a ma magnificent posture. And people are coming at her, the, the young men of the year. They're, they're, of course, they're all zooming in on her. And they all try to impress her with their knowledge of art. And she writes in her journal one night, uh, another person who sees only with his eyes. I love that line. Sees only with his eyes. That is why it's magnificent. But uh, yes, to answer that question, that material is there at Longfellow House, and they've got a wonderful staff. And if you have a mind to access them, they will, they will, they will uh, facilitate it for you. Wonderful staff. One of the best staffs I've ever worked with. I have to say. I hope they're watching tonight. <laughs> We'll let them know. Um, another question is, and did you find out, did Henry ever spend the night, a night at the Wayside Inn? I don't, I don't believe he did. But he may have, but there's nothing in the record that I can find that he did. He definitely, some of the accounts I've read is that he went there before. He, he did, I mean, it was closed, number one. And uh, Fields was taking him there. In fact, there's one entry in the diary, Fields, I'm sure that's what they were, they were going. It was in September and he's angry and you very rarely see Henry express anger, but he's waiting, waiting, waiting and Fields never shows up. And I think they wanted to go out there that day and then a couple of weeks later they go on Halloween, on Halloween, by the way. And in that opening line, he mentions a hobgoblin look of the house. I mean, who's to say, but who knows, you know? No, I, I, I could not determine, I don't think he ever stayed there, but, he could have, but it's not. It's, if he did, it's not in his journal and it's not in his correspondence. So <laughs> he was kind of, kind of became a pretty much of a homebody. Uh, although his friends went there, Luigi Monti went there, others went there, Ole Bull went there. I mean, did I say that Henry could speak 15 languages fluently with 12,000 books in the house and 45 different dialects? And he read them all. And he, he, he translated works from German, French, Italian, Spanish. into when he was teaching at Bowdoin, there were no texts. So he did his own text, he did his own translation, published nine books like that while he was in his 20s at, at Bowdoin College. So he was really a brilliant man and, and, and a polymath, that, really, in my view. That actually does lead to another question about Greek, whether he spoke Greek and visited Greece. Oh, he, well, he didn't visit Greece. No, he never visited Greece, but he spoke Greek. He has a quote from Sophocles uh, in one of the journals in Greek. He, sp you know, he spoke Greek, Latin. Uh, I don't think he read Hebrew, but he, he might have dabbled in it. There are some books in Hebrew. He certainly wrote the Jewish Cemetery at Newport. But no, he never visited Greece. Uh, but he did. He and he had a, he had a, a I would say a rudimentary grasp of it. But uh, he picked up languages. It was an amazing facility, and everyone said that, that, that was one of the compliments when he speaks German to Germans. His German is good as is as good as as um, I forget it was Edward Everett. He said he's, he's amazing when he was teaching at Harvard. He said he speaks French to Frenchmen, he speaks German to Germans, he speaks Spanish. This when Don Pedro of uh, the Emperor of Brazil visits, they speak in Portuguese. When Ole Bull comes, they speak in Norwegian. When Frederica Bremer and uh, Jenny Lind come, they speak in Swedish. I mean, it's fluently, you know, it's, it's astonishing. Brilliant man. Quite interesting. Um, let's see. Um, Cameron is asking if you could speak a little bit about Henry's roots in Portland, Maine. Well, and, yes. And his City by the Sea poem. Yes. Uh, yes. This is the whole first chapter of the book is about his growing up in Portland. He was a, ch a child of Portland, grew up in, and, and actually we've mentioned how the Longfellow house is unique. I think Longfellow is unique in that I don't know how many other writers have not one, but two of their homes, which are historic sites. The Wadsworth uh, uh, Longfellow House in Portland on Co Congress Street is a magnificent facility that's owned and operated by the Maine Historical Society. And Henry was very proud of his Maine roots. And his father went to Harvard, his grandfather went to Harvard. Grandfathers on both sides, Peelig went to Harvard, and yet his, his father was an overseer at Bowdoin College, newly recently established in 1794, I think it was. And so they sent both of their oldest sons to school at the same time. And you'll read why they wanted Henry to watch out for his older brother, Stephen, who kind of had wandering ways. And so Henry, the younger brother, was uh, required to look after him. But uh, he loved Maine. He, he, he loved Bowdoin, but also when he came back from Europe, he had, 
he, he wasn't just learning languages. He was hanging out with the uh, diplomatic uh, corps in Madrid. He became acquainted with Washington Irving. He visited the capitals of Europe, and then he came back to Maine, to Brunswick, and you know, by Maine is Maine. It was, it was up in the down east, and he and he had been, you know, to all these capitals. He was desperate to get out, and he wanted. He said, "I, I have to, I have to go on a larger stage." So it took him seven years, and finally he got the appointment to Harvard, and he went and he took that in an instant. But uh, he loved Maine. He was very respectful of it. Uh, after Fanny's death and after he retired, after 25 years of teaching, he vowed to never speak in public again. He just didn't. And he admired people like Dickens and uh, Rachel Felix, the French actress, uh, 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 and Fanny Kemble, the actress. Of their, their, he marveled at their skills to speak in public. But he didn't like to do it. And yet, on the 50th anniversary of his college class at Bowdoin, he agreed to come up and give uh, a presentation, which I opened the book with. He called it Moratori Salutamus, and it was from the Latin, we who are about to die salute you. And I went up to several trips to Bowdoin, but just to kind of recapture and relive that moment, when finally he came in and he gave a public speech. And it was 1,100 people. It was covered on the front pages of newspapers, all literally everywhere all over the United The poem itself, 290 line ode, was printed in its, uh, to, in its, uh, in its uh, totality. And it's quite a poem. And he's, 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 you know, he's 50 years, however old he is, in 1879, he's at 72. And, but he looks a lot older. And he's contemplating, you know, old age and, and we who are about to die. So it's a magnificent poem and a reflection. And, and he did that for Maine, for Bowdoin uh, College. And so he's, very, very respectful of his roots. And I know at one point he likes Eastman Johnson, the artist who says, a main man, he calls it, he's a main man, he's really good. So uh, the, you talk about my lost youth, that poem, which I you quote in the first chapter. You know, Robert Frost's very first book of poetry was a tribute to Longfellow, uh, The Wind's Will, he called it. And that's a line from that poem, The Wind's Will is the Boy's Will. So uh, uh, though a lot of people dismissed Longfellow in the 20th century, a lot of very important people didn't, like Robert Frost, thankfully. But yes, I gave a presentation for Bowdoin College. It's for, for a person who asked about Maine, either go to my website, we'll have it up there. I, I think actually the Wikipedia article on me has a link to the Bowdoin presentation. It's different from this one. These all have been different key to the venues. And I really talk about Henry's relationship with Maine and with Bowdoin. And for that person who would like to know more about it, I, I think I do a pretty decent job with it there. So go take a look at that. I Can you tell us your website address? Oh, oh yes, I, I, I would be thrilled. Thank you for asking. It's a simple nicholasbazbanes.com. And I see H O L A S B A S B A N E S dot com. You should be able to get it. But, uh, I just put it in the comments. Hopefully, I, I typed it properly. <laughs> I need you to find, there aren't many bands names in the world. This is a, a Google will get you there. Um, I'm just going back up. Um, we have a question about what was very interesting that you found about the wayside in itself through your research. And you live I, near here. I, I so. love that it's an authentic, uh, I, I'm grateful to Henry Ford, you know, really for having the foresight to preserve it and to, to protect it. And I'm glad it's, I'm glad it's not a, a, a B and B, you know, I'm glad it's uh, not something else. I, it's, it's authentic. It's wonderful. And the food is great. And it's, a, and it's, it's not just a wonderful inn. You, it's a, it's a destination. Uh, and I feel when I go in there, you know, uh, never mind Longfellow, George Washington and Lafayette were there. Daniel Webster was there. It's got quite a fantastic history. And I love places that really, you know, ooze with history and, and it's authentic. And it's uh, good people such as yourself running it. And they know, and you know the, the uh, importance of the place, you feel it. So I guess it's everything. It's ambiance, it's, it's, it's the relevance to my subject. You've got a Longfellow garden there, what's, what's not to like? You've got a couple of little rooms there with our Longfellow artifacts. So if you're a Longfellow person, you know, you can go there, and the and the and the food's great, and you got a wonderful bar with a uh, one of a kind fireplace. I mean, uh, let's let's hope that when uh, the weather clear, we get into the seasons, and maybe we can go there in the winter. And, and yes, 
Yes. Um, we have also, thank you for that, by the way. Um, we love it too. <laughs> We're here. Um, the feel of the pages in the book and the edges, is there a story behind your choice of, of using that for the design of your book? This, this is entirely the work of my editor, Vicki Wilson. And uh, when she <coughs> sent me an email, you know, when she said, the first copy of the book is in my hands. It was in the middle of the pandemic. And she's been around for, uh, she's a veteran, senior, highly regarded uh, editor who, Anne Rice is one of her authors. She did, she's had many, many wonderful authors. And she said, I think this is easily one of the most beautiful books I've ever produced. I'm very proud of it. And so really she picked the deckle edges, the good quality paper. She chose to do the end sheets, the four color end sheets, two different end sheets, one different one in the front, one on the one in the back. So um, it's just beautiful. And and I was surprised. I, I didn't have anything. Oh, the writer doesn't do the dust jacket. He doesn't do anything except write the book, you know. So well, we I agree, obviously. I sign off on a jacket and the art. I loved it that they picked that Julia Margaret Cameron photograph because it was such a magnificent photograph. She was a fabulous photographer. And just the way she has him with, with that, that hand there is exquisite. And, it, and it, as I said at the beginning of the remark, it just pictures him at the very height of his celebrity. And that's the Longfellow that everybody knew. And, you know, by contrast, you get into the book, well, I want to show you the Longfellow that not many people know, and the young Longfellow, the very passionate Longfellow, the man who loved and respected women. And I mean that in, in uh, every, every, every good way. I mean, he was a, a really thoroughly decent and loving guy. And so anyway, I think we have two more. If you're up for it, we have two more hey, questions. I'm, I'm, I'm here as long as uh, you have to right. ask questions. <laughs> we have a question. In your book, you tell about Fanny's enjoyment of the Berkshires. Did she continue oh. to visit after she married Henry? I'm sorry. I just finished the second part of that. Yep. Did she continue to visit the Berkshires after she married Henry? Um, they bought. She bought a parcel of land out there. You know, and, and if that person who asked the question, she wanted before she decided, agreed to marry Henry, again, she had a, an exceedingly wealthy father. Did I fail to mention that the wedding gift to Fanny and Henry was the purchase of that house and, you know, that, that, that Georgian mansion, that was the wedding and the contents and the furniture and the land in front going down to the Charles River, which is why there's a park there and it isn't developed. Uh, at one point, long before she got married, she she went to the Berkshires. It was where her mother was born and brought up. It's where Catherine Maria Sedgwick, it's a name that hasn't come up, but she is, was a very prominent author of the period. Uh, and and in that book I showed you, Homes of American Authors, Sedgwick is the only woman in there. Well, this was Fanny's dearest aunt, Kitty. Fanny turned to Sedgwick for advice after the death of her mother. You mentioned Humanities Magazine. I have a piece in there right now. It just went up. And it's about dealing with death and dying and as in, the, in the eyes of the Longfellows. When Fanny went to Europe, she, they, were, they were mourning the loss of her 20-year-old brother, Charlie, and their mother two and a half years earlier, also of consumption. And they had a cousin who they were traveling with who was also dying of consumption. And Henry had just lost his wife. So when they meet, you have all these people who are dealing with grief in various ways. I thought that would make for a pretty interesting article. Well, Fanny has, was... was loved the Berkshires and what she really dreamed of doing and I, that chapter I call Castles in Spain and she said her unattainable she, of course she was so very well read and that was a line from uh, Roman de la Rose the, the French poem where you know the unattainable dreams are castles in Spain and she said uh, I think of these things as castles in Spain and what she wanted to do was to build a chateau overlooking the Housatonic River and the Berkshires near her friend, Catherine Maria Sedgwick, their dear Aunt Kitty, who had a group of women. I mean, they had a group of very accomplished, artistic women. Jenny Lynn, the uh, actress, was a very close uh, Sedgwick friend and also a very good friend of Fanny Appleton and later Henry Long, uh, Longfellow, the Longfellows. And so Fanny asked her father to buy her a piece of land. He bought her 35 acres of land overlooking the Housatonic. And she was going to build a chateau overlooking overlooking the Husserl. So she planned to spend a great deal of time out there. Then 
they got married and they summered. They went out there somewhat, but really they gravitated to the seashore to Nahant. And so I write about Nahant and they went down to Newport and then they bought a cottage on Nahant, which is really where they should have been in July when she had her horrible accident. Her father was dying and she was in Cambridge visiting with him. And so she was making day trips. When they, when everything cries out for them for being on the hunt on the swelteringly hot day, she was in Boston. And uh, you know, you talk about horrible luck, but, uh, but the Berkshires play a very important role in the book. I mean, they are the subject of an entire chapter for very good reason. And then Henry also bought 35 adjoining acres adjoining acres to Stephanie. So they planned to build something out there. They didn't. And, and that parcel of land was just sold about three years ago and it was still undeveloped. My wife and I went out and walked it and the realtor showed us around. I think it was sold for four or five million dollars or whatever. Well worth it, exquisite uh, uh, acreage, 70 acres really only overlooking one of the oxbows in the Housatonic River. It's beautiful. And she loved it and Henry loved it, but they also loved uh, the seashore too. So, but yes, the Berkshire is a very, very important, and I, which I discussed in my talk with the Mount, which is out and uh, I talked a little bit about that too, because of course that's the Berkshire. And that's available too, actually online. So Terrific. anyway, but thank you for that question. It's, a, it's an important one. And just the final question, um, what was Fanny's exact education? Well, again, um, we're talking about, she's born in 1817. You know, the first, we talk about the seven sisters of higher education. The very first one is Mount Holyoke, and that isn't established until 1837. Smith comes some years afterward and the others. There was no formal education for women. So, and this was one of the great attractions, by the way, of people like Charles Sumner. One reason Charles Sumner took the longest time to get married I have it on good authority, the Sumner biography, John Stauffer said, because what he wanted was a clone of Fanny Longfellow. She was brilliant. They, they, these brilliant intellectual men like Longfellow and Sumner, they wanted a woman that they could engage with intellectually. And unfortunately, there was no higher education for women at that time, unless you were exceedingly wealthy, and if you had a mind to educate your daughters. So Fanny was educated by Elizabeth Pum you know, with tutors, the best tutors you could find, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, George Barrel Emerson, I mean, this is from the age of 10. She studied dance with Papanti, who brought the waltz to America. She studied art with Francis Grader, uh, Francis Lieber, the, the uh, literary theorist and uh, uh, German expatriate, uh, tutored her in Italian and French and German. So she was taught exquisitely from the earliest age, and she embraced, it wasn't only that she, she was taught, but she embraced it. She absolutely embraced uh, everything that anything had to do with the intellect and the arts. And she, she, she was dazzling, I have to tell you. I, uh, she captured me. Uh, I, I never expected her to, to be there throughout the book, but uh, she just kept saying, I'm not done with you yet. You know, and there's, there's more <laughs> than what it was. I mean, she's there to the very end, really. She was. And I think if you read, look at the construction of the book, because the 19th century is so rich, uh, they, they, they wrote letters, they wrote beautiful letters, uh, they, wrote, they kept journals and, and diaries, they documented their lives. And you, I'm able to go into the 19th century and I'm able to, to, to have them speak in their voices. You know, I mean, really, I, and I, there's nothing, there's nothing adulterated there. I mean, it's, it's their words. The only thing I changed is Fanny used the ampersand for Anne. And I say that at the outset. And that's permitted by the Chicago Banyan Manual of Stuff. Is that for readability when she says and, it's and. I mean, other than that, it's on the spellings of theirs and everything she says, it's in her voice and it's in his voice. And I kind of have them in alternating chapters. Uh, and then they become a couple and then and the, rest is, uh, the rest is the story. And there you have it. I don't know if that's responsive to your question, but. <laughs> Well, does anyone have any last minute questions? We're almost a, oh, about an hour here. Um, so uh, I don't see any, I see some comments that we can share with you about other books. Yes, I'm um, looking at them. Our children's, but you can see the chat? Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Barbara Cooney and about little women that it's reminding her of, yeah. Yeah, well. 
Um, yeah. So um, I just can't thank you enough. This was a real treat after a long sort of lull and wondering what to do, but with programming to, to have you here and tuning in across the airwaves. So um, hopefully, you know, this, this Zoom concept, uh, you know, people please let me know um, how you know how you thought it went you can feel free to send me an email and uh, the wayside and we'll be planning future programs as well but Nick we just let can't me just say if anyone has any questions for me yes on my website there's a feature there where they can email me and I do answer my emails so I'd be delighted yeah, to hear from anybody because I can't wait thank, to thank you for doing this thank you for doing this as a tough times for everybody and it's nice to be able to reach some of your people because let's face it it's Longfellow's Wayside Inn these are Longfellow people exactly exactly so, so very I'm good coming out there and see you all in person it'll be I hope sooner rather than later yes and we'll look forward to welcoming you back so <laughs> all right okay. well thank you very much and thank have a wonderful you. rest thank of your evening comments and they're very nice so thank you to everyone for who's here and posted such nice things. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay.